great to see so many faces here. And we really appreciate you coming out tonight, despite it looks like it's snowing outside and everything else. So first of all, um, I would just like to um, talk a little bit about our sponsors. Uh, this uh, seminar series is titled the changing, or, sorry, the, the Changing Climate of Natural Resources Management. And wait, the changing, the, the changing climate of natural resources management. And we are featuring a number of talks that are about how climate change is impacting our natural resources. And so um, this, is the this is put on by the College of Natural Resources, organized by the Wisconsin chapter of the Wildlife Society. And we are, I'm sorry, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. I'm a member of a couple of different organizations, so sometimes I forget where I am. So Wisconsin, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife is an extension organization within the uh, College of Natural Resources, and we do some extension events and things like that. We like to put on talks like this. But I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, um, in addition, of course, to the College of Natural Resources, and the Kennedy Graney Chair in Waterfowl Wetlands Conservation Endowment, also uh, Gerald and Helen Stevens Wildlife Endowments, Douglas and Carol uh, uh, Federighi Waterfowl Endowment Fund, and then, of course, University of Wisconsin um, Extension as well. So, with, um, and then, we always try to make a point to acknowledge that this land that we, that you know, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point sits on, um, sits on the land that is formerly territory of the Menominee and Ho-Chunk tribe. So we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous people. Without further ado, I would like to s welcome our speaker today. Rob Kroll is a policy analyst in the, <coughs> in the Division of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, shor uh, shortened it as Glyphwick, in Odana, Wisconsin. His duties include coordination of Glyphwick's climate change program and providing policy analysis and operational experience to the enforcement division. Glyphwick's climate change program is focused on integrating traditional ecological experiential knowledge with scientific research and natural resources <coughs> climate adaptation. Prior to Glyphwick, Rob served for 18 years as a waterways conservation officer in the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, specializing in natural resources criminal investigation. Rob has a master's in environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School and did his undergraduate work in environmental studies at Northland College. Robert has been with Glyphwick for two years now and while he has, in his time there, he has uh, published, uh, what is the document called again? It'll be uh, this one. So this is the document that he has published, <laughs> and we can explain everything as we go. And this has been, um, a, this has been uh, awarded the Climate Adaptation Leadership Award by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So Robert's quite accomplished, and so I would like you to take a moment to please welcome Robert Kroll. <laughs> Oh, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> All right. Let's just go back. Oh, there we go. Let's just do that. Let's just do that. Okay. Technical difficulties. Sorry. Okay, well, uh, miigwech. Thank you very much. Buju Niji Bumadazi, Rob Indigenakaz, Gawain the Damascene, Philadelphia and Dunjaba, Glyphwick and Danoki. If you speak Ojibwe, you know a few things about me already. You know my name's Rob. You know I'm originally from Philadelphia. You know I'm not Ojibwe and that I work for Glyphwick. Um, and you can tell exactly that, by the way, I introduced myself. An Ojibwe person standing up here, would you have used different words? Um, so when we think about indigenous languages, what we realize, and this is gonna be kind of throughout my talk here today, is that they don't translate well into English. Um, there are concepts and perspectives and meaning that doesn't come through. So um, at our Glyphwick, um, in our Glyphwick Climate Change Program, in Glyphwick in general, one of our missions is to integrate Ojibwe culture into everything that we do. Um, in our Climate Change Program, we try to take that just one step farther, and we think that we're integrating what we do into the culture. Uh, so that's why I introduce myself in Ojibwe. It also helps me to 
remember who I work for and why I'm here. So what is Glyphwick? We are an intertribal natural resource agency exercising authority delegated to us by our 11 Ojibwe member tribes to implement federal court orders and interjurisdictional agreements related to their treaty rights. So we help them secure and implement their treaty rights in ceded territories, and we also help them to cooperatively, cooperatively manage, restore, and protect ceded territory natural resources and habitats. So we have biologists, a number of our biologists were actually educated here. Um, we have lawyers and policy people such as myself. We have public information folks who do a lot of outreach and education and also produce some really cool publications like this one here that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we have conservation officers that enforce tribal conservation codes off reservation. And we'll talk about why and how that happens in just a second here. So is there anybody here that can tell me what we mean by treaty rights? Okay, well then I guess I get to go through all my slides. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, treaty rights have to uh, deal with negotiated agreements between two sovereign entities uh, dating back to the original inhabitants of this area with the United States government. That's correct. So do all native nations have treaty rights? No, they don't. Only if they have treaties with the United States government because there are some native nations that don't and some treaties that don't reserve rights. All they were is an agreement that says you can live here on this piece of land and we'll give you some wagons and some money, things like that. So this is the Ojibwe ceded territory. Um, the Ojibwe people ceded land to the United States in a series of treaties in the mid 1800s. Um, you can see that ceded territory takes up a big chunk of Wisconsin, a smaller chunk of Minnesota, and a good sized chunk of Michigan. Um, in all of these treaties, the Ojibwe people um, ceded land to the United States. And in all of these treaties, they reserved their existing rights to hunt, fish, and gather in the lands that they ceded. Um, these treaties were made between the Ojibwe people and the United States government. Um, as we'll talk about here in a minute, the states didn't factor into this because there weren't states here at this point. Um, and the history that we hear from elders and, and people within the community is that those people, those Ojibwe people who negotiated those treaties um, had in mind that they were preserving their ability to use that land to hunt, fish, and gather as they always did into the future, um, they say seven generations. And we're here with Glyphwick to try and preserve those rights seven generations on. So I want to think for a minute about sovereignty. And sovereignty is actually a non-tribal principle applied to Indians. And we'll kind of get this out of the way really quickly. Indians, in this case, is a legal term. Uh, it is used in all of the laws of the United States that pertain to Native nations. Um, in common usage, it's kind of now a pejorative. Um, it makes people uncomfortable. But as a term of legal art, it still exists. So in cases like this, we do have to use the term. The term sovereignty is actually European in origin. And it's all of those characteristics that make a nation self-governing. So it's the ability to control people, to hold land, and to make agreements with sovereigns external to oneself. So peace treaties, um, political alliances, economic treaties are all indications that a nation, a state, is sovereign because it's 
negotiating with other sovereigns. First came into use in the 14th century. It establishes the characteristics of a nation, and it is the unique trait that enables self-government. And native nations exercised all these powers prior to the arrival of Europeans in North America and afterwards. Internally, establishing governing systems for themselves, regulating social, political, and economic practices, and externally by entering, entering into agreements and alliances with other tribal nations, with the British government, the French government, the colonial governments, and with the United States. So Anishinaabe or Ojibwe sovereign rights were known as the usual rights of occupancy because native people didn't have titles. They didn't own land in the European concept that we use. So the rights are derived from the ancestral use of a specific place for traditional purposes and cultural expression. And those rights include the right to tribal land and water, all rights to practice traditional customs and religion, all rights to retain and develop Indian languages and cultures, and the right to self-government. And we know that our United States government limits those sovereign powers to our native nations. Um, legal terms, they're termed domestic dependent nations, which means that the United States government still does some of those sovereign things for them. So treaties generally, when we talk about them, were made by the United States and not by individual states, but there are some exceptions. One I can think of offhand, uh, the state of New York, between the time the revolution ended and the US Constitution was ratified, made a treaty with the Haudenosaunee people, um, the seven uh, tribes in New York State, that's still being fought about today in court and in other places because it predated the United States and they're still trying to maintain rights that they obtained in a treaty with a state. Treaties are the supreme law of the land and that's based on the US Constitution, Article 5, Clause 2. However, typically one side of the equation, one of those sovereign parties, was a little bit less strict about how that treaty was interpreted and enforced or ignored. Treaties are made for various purposes. Peace treaties, the treaty that ended World War II, the treaty that ended the Revolutionary War. Uh, mutual defense treaties. Um, I was reading something around Thanksgiving last year that suggested that the first Thanksgiving wasn't really so much a the pilgrims invited their neighbors to a party kind of thing to celebrate the fact that they were there for a year. Uh, they had a mutual defense treaty with their neighbors against other tribes in the area. And the pilgrims were having a big party and shooting off guns and their neighbors heard that and came rushing to their defense and found a party and got invited to stay. Um, so that's an alternative and probably a very realistic interpretation of the actual first things. <coughs> and they can be understood as a contract between the two sovereign parties. So in all of the treaties uh, that were signed between the Ojibwe and the United States government, the Ojibwe people reserved existing rights, rights that they had as sovereign people before the creation of the United States, before Europeans ever came to this continent. And in this case, these are usufructory rights, the rights to use land, to hunt, fish, gather, practice religion. They had these rights, they reserved these rights. These are not special rights that were given to them by the United States government. These are rights that they always had and that they kept for themselves. So this is actually Article 5 of the Treaty with the Chippewa, dated July 29, 1837. The privilege of hunting, fishing, and gathering the wild rice upon the lands, rivers, and lakes included in the territory ceded is guaranteed to the Indians during the pleasure of the President of the United States. 
And you can interpret that, and it's been interpreted to the, by the courts to mean as long as there is a United States, the treaty is valid. However, after these treaties were created, the states came into being, Wisconsin and Michigan and Minnesota, and they weren't party to the treaties. And they came in, in under something called the Equal Footing Doctrine. And what the Equal Footing Doctrine is, is the legal idea that states that entered the Union after the ratification of the Constitution came in on the equal footing with the original 13 colonies and retained, got, were given those same powers that the original 13 colonies had. The power that we're talking about here is the power to control wildlife and fisheries. So when the states came in, they fairly quickly started making conservation laws, hunting and fishing regulations, and then started enforcing them on people who were out practicing their treaty rights, both in ceded territory and on reservations. And Ojibwe people were getting arrested, being jailed, having their guns and other equipment confiscated. Um, this was during a time of, uh, it was even before assimilation, it was during that time when the best thing to do was make sure there were no more Indians. Um, so locking them up helped to take Indian children and put them in boarding schools because now there was nobody to provide for their family. Uh, it helped to consolidate people on the reservations so then that reservation land could be sold to non-native people. Um, and this practice continued until the mid 20th century when Ojibwe people decided we need to take this to court. Um, so the Couture people in, in uh, Wisconsin got themselves arrested, some folks, on purpose so they could go to court and reaffirm their treaty rights. Same thing happened in Minnesota at Mill Lax. Uh, in Michigan on Lake Superior with commercial fishing. And we went to court. And what did the courts say? Well, there are canons of constructions that are construction that are used to interpret treaties. One of those canons of constructions is the idea that we construe treaties as they were to be understood by the tribes who negotiated them. So people who didn't speak English people who didn't understand European American legal concepts. And it construed those treaties liberally in the tribe's favor because they didn't speak the language or write the document and had to rely on interpreters who may or may not have had ulterior motives. The courts have found that neither Congress nor the president have expressly terminated those treaty rights. And statehood, that equal footing doctrine, also did not terminate the treaty rights. And then we have the ain't misbehaving interpretation. And what that means, we're going back to that pleasure of the president. What people understood back in the mid 1800s was that if they got along with their white neighbors, they would be able to keep their treaty rights. And that last 1854 treaty that was negotiated is a piece of that. Because at that time, there was a huge push to move the Ojibwe people into southern Minnesota. They were going to be removed from their traditional homelands. Some of them actually were removed to Sandy Lake in Minnesota, where they were supposed to go and collect treaty annuities. And because the annuities were late, and when they came, the meat was spoiled, the flour was bad, and several hundred people died there and the rest of them had to make their way home in the wintertime. Um, because of that, that 1854 treaty was negotiated and the people got reservations in their homeland and were able to stay. Many of them had to move significant distances to get to those reservations and then they had to stay there, but at least they didn't get sent to Oklahoma or somewhere else where they weren't familiar, they didn't know the land, they didn't know the creatures that lived there. <coughs> 
So treaty rights were re reaffirmed in these court cases. And what the courts found was that tribes had the right to continue the traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering way of life in all parts of the ceded territories, not just on their reservations, with the caveat that these activities take place on public land, not on my private property, your private property. As a matter of fact, if I have a friend and I want to invite my friend to come hunt on my land, and my friend is white and has a state hunting license in the state of Wisconsin, I can do that, and he can come hunt on my land. But if I have a native friend and I want to invite him or her to come hunt on my land and say, please come and exercise your treaty rights on my private property, the court has said that I don't have the ability to do that. Tribes have the right to virtually all of the natural resources found in the ceded territories. Now I'm not talking about every single deer and every single fish and every single tree. What I'm talking about is they have the ability to access those, same as everybody else does. But they are entitled to a maximum of 50% allocation of harvestable resources. This is where Glyphwick comes in, and this is where the tribe's sovereign powers come in, because this allows them to negotiate, particularly with the states, on quotas for things like walleye and deer, where they're very popular natural resources that everybody wants to go out and harvest. And Glyphwick, one of our important jobs is to make sure that when quotas are set, that tribal members are maintaining those quotas and not going over them. And it's not published well, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there that natives can just go out and kill as many deer as they want, take as many wall walleye as they want. That's not the case. Uh, they're very good about self-enforcing, the tribes are, and our job at Glyphwick, one of our jobs is to monitor that harvest because we have those contracts with the state agencies and we need to maintain that good faith. Treaty rights are tribal rights. They're retained by tribes as sovereigns, not each individual member. Tribes have regulatory authority on and off reservation over tribal members who are exercising their rights. That's why Glyphwick employs, employs conservation wardens to enforce those regulations in the ceded territory. Our wardens are also police officers um, accredited by the various states that they work in. Um, they can enforce felony level and above crimes on view as long as they turn that individual then over to local law enforcement. So our wardens aren't going out and checking uh, non-native hunters. If they run across something, they pass it along to, to state wardens. Um, and state wardens do the same thing when they run into tribal members. And tribes are required to co-manage cedatory resources with other sovereigns. So other tribes, remember I said Glyphwick is a agency that's made up by the 11 tribes, but also with the state and federal government. And now we get into a little bit of climate change and why is climate change important when it comes to the idea of treaty rights? Because those resources that people rely upon are gonna be impacted by climate change. And if you remember, the tribes have the right to virtually every resource in the ceded territory. But what if those resources aren't there anymore? Because those species have migrated north or aren't found in the area anymore. That can be viewed as a, a treaty rights issue, a treaty rights violation. So in the United States, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. There are 60 state recognized tribes and countless other tribes that have been disenfranchised by government policy and government action. Each of them have their own climate change story and that's not my story to tell. But I can talk about the flood that happened in 2016 on the Bad River Reservation that cut the reservation off uh, from the surrounding area and people were having to be helicoptered to go to dialysis appointments in town. Um, 
people who got cut off in town that couldn't get back home again and had to live in hotels for a couple weeks until they got a bridge. So we have infrastructure impacts. We have public health impacts. We know that our climate is changing. In the Med Midwest region, relative 1986 to 2016 versus 1901 to 1960, the average temperature has gone up by about a degree and a quarter. It's actually closer to a degree and a half now, I think. Our growing season up north has been extended by about nine days down here, possibly even a little bit more. And we're getting about 42% more strong storms, ones that cause damage like in the last photograph, ones that uproot manumen or wild rice during floating leaf stage and then cause the harvest to fail. Because we know these seasonal changes affect watershed hydrology. They affect stream flow and water quality and quantity, snow depth, the amount of ice on a lake and how long it stays there. So how will climate change affect tribes? You saw the infrastructure, I mentioned public health, but also all of these natural resources they rely upon. So we see people hunting deer, spearing walleye, gathering wild rice, making maple sugar. Anybody go to the sugar bush? You tapping yet? I know folks up in, just outside of Houghton, Michigan that are getting sap already. It's a little early. So one of the things we did in our climate change program at Glyphwick is we started with, we started with, and this happened before I even started, uh, climate change vulnerability assessment. This is version one. I have a few copies. Each of you got a handout with the link to the PDF version. So if you want to go download that and save a tree. But I do have a few copies up here if you, if you really want a hard copy tonight. Our goal was to use a holistic approach to assess vulnerability of over 60 culturally important beings, culturally important species, to climate change. And we didn't just kind of randomly say what 60 things can we pick in the ceded territories. Um, these animals and plants were selected for us during interviews with tribal members, tribal elders, harvesters, hunters and gatherers, um, and then also with interviews with our Glyphwick biologists and other uh, state DNR folks, stuff that we knew was um, vulnerable. And the other goal is to promote recognition that Anishinaabe or Ojibwe knowledge and worldview provide important and needed contributions to the understanding of resource vulnerability. Part of what we gathered for this vulnerability assessment was traditional ecological knowledge. And I really hate that term, but it's the one that we use because it's not just ecological knowledge, it's experiential knowledge, it's indigenous science. It's that lived experience and those lived observations from hundreds and thousands of years that still work. So it's change and survival and life way and observations and stories and language and manidug, which means spirits, beings and truth and culture. When we think about scientific ecological knowledge, that's our Western science, where we go out and we put a collar on a wolf and we track that animal for a couple years and see where it goes and what it does and where the kill sites are and where it had babies and kind of intrude into its life. And then somebody writes a paper that gets peer reviewed and it gets published. And we also wanted to include that accumulation of cultural tradition, practical experience and adaptation to environmental changes over time that make up that oral tradition. On the scientific side, we use NatureServe's Climate Change Vulnerability Index which incorporates climate projections and we used a high emission scenario or worst case scenario and a low emission scenario or best case scenario. So each being was run through twice. And that climate change vulnerability index tool comes out with a vulnerability score, which was then 
validated by expert reviews in the, within the scientific community and it was sometimes used to adjust the scores that came out of the CCVI. Our traditional uh, ecological knowledge outreach specialists did at least three interviews of each of our 11 communities. Um, those interviewees provided stories and teachings and knowledge about changes. And this information was given equal weight with those scientific expert opinions used to validate and in some kind of cases adjust those scores. And the results of this vulnerability assessment incorporate both. So the brochure that I have here, the one you can download online is version one. It only has about 11 of the beings that we assessed. We're still finishing up the big book with all 60. Hopefully that'll be out later this year. We separated those beings into swimmers and there will be a test on the Ojibwe Moan uh, when we're done, <laughs> so study quick. So swimmers and four-leggeds, flyers, and crawlers. Anybody notice that there's a bug? In that Ojibwe perspective, those insects are, the, are crawlers as well, even the ones that fly. And plants, those growing things. So what did we find? We found that swimmers right now are our most vulnerable category. And we know that. We know that Lake Superior is heating up faster than any other lake in the United States. We know that our swimmers are more vulnerable to warmer water. It changes their habitat. It changes their ability to feed. We know that our four-leggeds are a little bit less vulnerable in many cases. And that plants are pretty vulnerable as well. We also found out that the most frequently mentioned beings in interviews were also most, among the most vulnerable. So Manuman, which is wild rice, is the most vulnerable being in our assessment. Um, it's got pretty much everything stacked against it that a plant can have. It's an annual. Its seeds are heavy, so they don't disperse easily. It's very vulnerable to water quantity changes and water quality changes. It needs specific habitat. And if we get strong storms during the time when it's in floating leaf stage, when its roots aren't very well anchored in the bottom and the leaves are just floating on the surface, that flood can take those plants away and then there'd be no harvest that year. While booze is snowshoe hare, what we're seeing with snowshoe hare now is that they're turning white before it snows, which is making them very vulnerable to predators. Um, one of our interviews, uh, the interviewee suggested that he hadn't really seen Wabuj in his area, in his backyard, in about 15 years. And before that, he could go out in the backyard in the wintertime and literally snare rabbits and have them for dinner. Moose, Gijigatig is northern white cedar. It's a very important medicinal plant. It's also very important for maintaining wetlands. Uh, walleye, birch, sugar maple, but then some of the most mentioned beings were much less vulnerable and that had to do with because it was animals and plants that people were interested in and interacted with on a regular basis. So strawberries and blueberries, bears, and what was Casey or deer. So this is kind of just a graphic representation of most vulnerable to less vulnerable. Again, our swimmers are all fairly high up there. Uh, wild rice, Labrador tea, northern white cedar, tamarack. And then some of the things that we think are going to do fairly well under climate change. Largemouth bass are taking over in a lot of the walleye lakes up north. Um, White-tailed deer we think are going to do well under climate change. They live just fine down in Texas. And it's a whole lot warmer down there. Um, 
we don't know what's going to happen with chronic wasting disease. Um, some of the other things we talked about were seasonal indicators. And these are traditional things that people knew. Now it's time to go out and do these activities, these hunting and gathering and fishing activities. But from the Ojibwe perspective, and this will be kind of important in a slide or two, those spring peepers also tell the walleye it's time to go run and spawn. So when spring peepers start calling, it's time for walleye season, and it's time for the walleye to go spawn. Fireflies indicate that deer will be coming around and are ready to be hunted, except that fireflies aren't really doing so well right now. And if the deer don't see the fireflies, they're going to come around. As soon as popple leaves, aspen leaves, as big as a quarter, or some say beaver's ears, it's time for the suckers to run. Except that now those defined runs are a whole lot less defined. And when biologists are going out to sample, a lot of times they're finding walleye and northerns and suckers all spawning at the same time. And that didn't used to happen. So what does that mean? Climate change is making liars out of our storytellers. And this quote was from a St. Croix Ojibwe elder by the name of Carmen Butler. And hopefully the uh, audio will work and I'll let him tell this story. Two weeks before it freezes is when the tula bees hit and they run until it freezes during that two week time. So if the climate change makes this two-week thing start two months ahead of time, a lot of my people back in the day, are the ones of us that like to do this, are going to get messed up big time. Climate change did that. The walleye is doing it. I mean, the, the northern the suckers, if they don't see them things up there when they're supposed to, that messes up all the way down the line. So all the folks on this page are collecting and processing wild rice. Wild rice to the Ojibwe people is a huge deal. Wild rice is why they are where they are. Hundreds of years ago, the Ojibwe lived on the East Coast uh, up by the St. Lawrence Seaway. And they followed prophecy that brought them here to the Great Lakes, to the place where food grows on the water. And that food is manumen, wild rice. If wild rice goes away because of climate change, that's, an that's not just treaty rights issue. That's an existential threat to Ojibwe culture. So we know that culturally important beings are moving. They're shifting ranges, or they're disappearing due to climate change. We know that those seasonal indicators, like Carmen Butler was talking about, no longer correspond with their associated natural phenomena. We know that a loss of access to culturally important beings and those reciprocal relationships that have been maintained between people and those beings since time immemorial is an existential threat to indigenous culture and to physical and emotional health in indigenous communities. And we know that tribal homelands, reservations, and treaty ceded territories are fixed in place. Ojibwe people's treaty rights are only good in those ceded territories. If wild rice is only found in Canada, they don't have a right to go there and harvest. That's a big deal. 
But we also know that we need to adapt to climate change and in indigenous communities, adaptation actions need to be culturally appropriate and community supported. Which brings us to Gabugan Jigadeg Anishinaabe Ejitwad, Tribal Climate Adaptation Menu, which won the Climate Adaptation Leadership Award last year. Um, so this tool is a group effort. It's not a Glyphwick product. Glyphwick people were involved in it. I was involved in it in a very small way. Um, but the idea is how do we create an adaptation planning tool that integrates indigenous knowledge and culture and perspective and science with Western science and Western perspectives? And then how can we facilitate culturally appropriate adaptation between tribes and non-tribal partners? The bug and Zigadeg Anishinaabe Ejitwad doesn't mean climate adaptation menu because that concept isn't in Ojibwe Moan. When we went to one of the elders and we asked, what should we call this in Ojibwe? That's what he told us. Those words, we don't have words for that. So explain to me what this book does. And we said, well, this book uses traditional perspective to help us respond to climate change. And what he gave us loosely translated to doing something the Anishinaabe way. And Anishinaabe is that original man, that first man, that first person that Kichimanidu created and put on the earth. So it's doing something the original way, the first way, with those original perspectives. Why? If any of these folks were here today, they would tell you that they went to a planning workshop in 2017 put on by the Northern Institute um, Applied Climate Science, or NIACS. And they were testing out a forested watershed menu that NIACS was creating uh, with a wild rice project, wild rice restoration. And they thought it was a wonderful product. It helped them really think about ways to incorporate climate change into wild rice restoration. But what it didn't do was reflect any of those indigenous cultural perspectives that were going to be needed to make that a community supported project when they went back home. So we just look real briefly from the forest adaptation menu that NIACS put out. Strategy nine, facilitate community adjustments through species transitions by introducing species that are expected to be adapted to future conditions. Managed transition. This tree is not gonna be here in 100 years, so let's plant something that we know will. From our tribal adaptation menu, encourage community adjustments and transition while maining, maintaining reciprocity and balance. So if we have to bring in a new species, or if a new species is gonna come here because its it range expands, then let's seek out and share that traditional cultural knowledge of potential new beings from the people where those beings are native. So we know how to interact with it and have that relationship. But also sharing our knowledge of what we have in our place with people north of us where our beings might go so that they can have those relationships too. The menu also has a guiding principles section in it. Uh, it's a good introduction to the paradigm shift that you need to make if you're going to do climate adaptation in indigenous communities. It provides that framework to integrate those things into the culture, into the adaptation planning process. It also helps to decolonize scientific research, bring it into indigenous communities in ways that make sense there. And it provides guidance for non-tribal folks like myself that work in indigenous communities. The whole menu, including the guiding principles, was written from an Ojibwe and Menominee perspective, but it was designed so that other tribes from other places could incorporate their knowledge as well 
to do climate adaptation in their communities and work with their partners. The perspective shift that I was talking about, the paradigm shift, Mindinawe Maganidug means all my relatives. And it's the idea that those other beings are not just resources for us to harvest and use, but they're also beings that were put here by the Creator with instructions, and that their relatives, their teachers, they are original teachers that people learn from. And decisions for use of those relatives were communal decisions made with that recognition and respect. But with our top-down management style now, it's not communal anymore, but it's made by individuals, landowners, agencies, and institutions. And it's that top-down, resource-centric, this is a thing and I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do for my personal human reasons. So the adaptation workbook process, and I know I'm getting close on time. <laughs> um, when we use this menu, we go, th we go through a structured process where we have people, land managers, land owners come in with projects in mind, goals that they already want for their land, whether that's the state, whether that's an individual landowner with a sugar bush. We ask them to assess that project based on the climate change impacts that they expect in their area. And then reevaluate their goals based on what they've learned about what's going to happen and how those goals might have to be changed. Then we identify and implement adaptation approaches and tactics. And that's where the menu comes in. Once you decide what you're going to do on your land, go back and monitor it. And if it's not working, start over again. It's a circle, not a little box. Uh, that monitoring in a lot of cases can be that traditional harvesting, hunting, fishing, and gathering where people are out on the landscape seeing what's going on, and then they can come back and tell you. These are just some of the cultural practices and community engagement pieces in the menu. Um, you can see they're in the first three strategies. That's intentional. None of the other menu products that NIAC's produced have these community engagement pieces or cultural practices. But before you're starting a project, consult cultural leaders and members and elders. Respect for the relations. And think, remember that sometimes doing nothing is actually doing something. We're managers. Well, some of us are going to go out and be natural resource managers when we get out of college. Some of us already are or have some natural resource management responsibilities. We're managers. We want to manage things. We want to do stuff. Here's a problem. We got to fix it. Maybe not. Maybe what's going to happen in that place where the wind came through and knocked down all the trees is what's supposed to happen. And maybe we just need to sit back and watch that and learn from it. Because maybe those beings that come in there to that disturbed ground are those beings that need to be there and are going to be the ones that are going to be adapted for the future. We've only been doing this for about a year. We're holding our fourth, fifth uh, tribal adaptation menu workshop starting Monday in Ashland, uh, Wisconsin, hosted by the Red Cliff Tribe. Um, but we've already got 28 projects across the Midwest, the Northeast, far south as Oklahoma, and South Dakota, where people are using this menu, in many cases, tribal land, but in some cases, tribal partners are using it to inform adaptation actions, uh, Ottawa National Forest used the menu to plan out a series of culvert replacements and create wetlands above the culvert that were going to be planted with culturally important, medicine, medicinally important plants. 
So in some of our workshops, these are just some of the projects that were done. Um, paper birch habitat and restoration, forest management, cultural fire, moose habitat, stream crossings, cedar restoration, sea level rise preparation in Florida, the Miccosukee tribe. We really didn't expect somebody from Florida to show up at one of our workshops that happened up on at College of Menominee Nation last year. But we helped them plan for sea level rise for culturally important sites. Um, as part of our workshop, our folks have to make a poster with their adaptation actions. And you just kind of see some of that thought process that went into this. With that, uh, we have a few minutes in here, I think, uh, that I can take some questions. Otherwise, miigwetch, miu. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. What I want to do is I want to uh, <coughs> want to say miigwetch also for your uh, presentation. Uh, also for using the, uh, the word bean. My older Anishinaabe brother, uh, Miku Gabo, they responded. And they're translating to the Great Lakes. Teaching with him, he always talked about beans. Human beings, we're just one being among many beings. That we learn to respect all those beings that did a good job. Be good. And I think all the different beings are uh, there, the epistemology of that knowledge of where it comes from there, too. And so the background history. I don't want to say that much. Uh, I just retired here from the university, but I spent 35 years at Bad River as a tribal judge, enforcing some of the Rights and different things there too. So uh, I thought you did a good job uh, in making this cross comparison, the importance of it, what's happening, and indigenous knowledge at the same time there too. You tell me that you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Thank you. <laughs> Miigwech. Other questions? It seems when. <clears throat> Towards the middle of the presentation, when you had showed the like more Western science being aligned with the more traditional, and the result was kind of the the menu itself, and it seemed there was a lot of overlap in the traditional and the Western science. And obviously, there's no like right answer to this, and it would probably de depend on who you ask. But it seems like the traditional knowledge in a lot of cases validates what the more Western science came up with or vice versa. That is what exactly kind of your take on that. That's exactly what we found was that that experiential real world knowledge validated the things that we were hearing from biologists and other scientists. And that's what we're finding in a lot of cases now throughout the US is that indigenous people already knew a lot of the things that scientists are now just figuring out. But nobody listened. <laughs> we have time for about one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Yes, sir. Well, I was curious in the statement about being an adaptation to climate change. Is there a parallel movement or document or approach in actually dealing with climate change, or is it inherent in the initiative? So at Glyphwick, because we're a natural resource agency, our focus is specifically on adapting beings, whether it's human beings or non-human beings. Um, the tribes themselves have various mitigation activities happening trying to stop climate change. So for example, Bad River um, has a major solar project going on right now. 
uh, Lac de Flambeau has a resilience initiative that, in, that um, not only takes energy efficiency and some solar stuff and some other things, they're trying to do a holistic uh, climate change mitigation approach and think about it from the same uh, cultural perspective. And it also includes that idea that um, tribal people, indigenous people are, are some of the people who are most affected by climate change, but did the least to cause it. And I don't know if I answered your question. 